Morning. Uh, I want to talk about Advent. We're into December. The countdown to Christmas has legitimately begun. All of you who put up trees before the beginning of December um, no longer need to feel guilty. We're into December. It's okay for the trees to be up now. Um, and what I want to talk about is, uh, you remember we did 40 days of waiting earlier in the year? 24 more days of waiting. We're going to make it up to a full 64 days. Now, last year in the run-up to Christmas, uh, Matthew was at university, um, and Fiona wanted him to share in the build-up to Christmas. So, uh, as usual, we bought three uh, 99p advent calendars from Lidl, uh, and Fiona, at great expense, I think it cost about £5 to have it sent to Matthew, this 99p calendar. Uh, and sure enough, he never got it, because it didn't fit through the letterbox of where he was living. And so they took it back to the college and they put it in a pigeon hole where Matthew didn't find it until months after Christmas. And then eventually, the next time he came home, he brought it with him, just left it in his room and forgot about it. So you could say that was a bit of a waste of an advent calendar. But the good news is that uh, last week when Fiona and I, uh, we're supposed to be on diet, so we're not buying chocolate for ourselves. But then what happened is we both got so obsessed with chocolate, we were desperate to... Uh, uh, to scavenge some from somewhere and then we remembered Matthew's old advent calendar so we dug it out and we opened it and we ate all the chocolate here's what's left uh, and as we did we read all the little messages in the doors that you open as you as you go through uh, each little door you see you get a bit of chocolate and you get a little message and they were things like this um, have a magical Christmas who ate all the mince pies uh, jingle all the way uh, can you draw Santa's sleigh? Uh, is it snowing yet? All these kinds of, they're not profound things. Right? Now, there's nothing wrong with any of that. And I, I don't want to be one of those Christians who gets all uptight and furious about the commercialization of Christmas. Um, I've got no problem with that. I like that. I like all the stuff that goes with Christmas. I like turkeys. I like uh, walnut whips, by the way, if anyone's trying to think what to get me this year, walnut whips. So I'm not raging against this advent calendar, but what I do think is it's very weak. It's not enough, is it? It's it's not, it doesn't really get you much. I feel like all the build up for Christmas and if all it's about is uh, snowballs and reindeer, then we've missed something. Here's another example. This is from the uh, 2010 Doctor Who Christmas special. It was called A Christmas Carol. Uh, and in that episode, we're told this, I'm quoting now. <clears throat> On every world, wherever people are, in the deepest part of the winter at the exact midpoint, everybody stops and turns and hugs, as if to say, well done, well done everyone, we're halfway out of the dark. Back on Earth, we called this Christmas. Now, I love Doctor Who, and A Christmas Carol is maybe my single favourite episode, but that, that is very weak stuff. It just... I feel like, even if you're not a Christian, you've got to be thinking there has to be more to this. And of course, as Christians, we very much believe that there is. And what it is, is that here at the, the darkest and dampest and coldest part of the year, especially this year, which in a lot of ways has been a wretched year with uh, COVID, of course, and the ongoing problems with getting Brexit to work uh, and Donald Trump and all the rest of it, we all need to dig much deeper, don't we, than just give everyone a hug and say, well done. People need something much more than Santa and snowballs and hugs. What people need is a hope, a significant, substantial hope. Not just in a kind of vague sense of, oh, I hope things get better next year. But something with a foundation, something that matters. So with all that in mind, today I want to look at the story of the baby Jesus at the temple. <clears throat> Now, in carol services, uh, we read lots and lots from the first one and a half chapters of Luke's Gospel. And it's full of all the bits that we're familiar with. It's, uh, you know, evil kings taking censuses and um, young couples being turned away because there's no room at the inn. And mangers and angels singing to shepherds as they watch o'er their flocks by night. All that stuff is in the first chapter and a half of Luke. Um, but I want to pick up what happens after that. So it's the second half of the same chapter. We're going to begin in Luke 2, chapter 21. What happened the next week? Luke tells us eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus, the name given to him by the angel, even before he was conceived. 
and then it was time for their purification offering, as required by the law of Moses after the birth of the child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. <clears throat> now Luke's Gospel tells us about two meetings at the temple. Uh, one of them with Simeon and one with Anna. And this fits the Old Testament idea that one witness isn't enough to establish something, but uh, you need two witnesses to testify in a, in a trial or anything like that. So here we've got two witnesses, Simeon and Anna, who both recognise who the baby Jesus is. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm just going to focus on Simeon today. So I don't want to dilute and, and try and cover too much. We'll just look at Simeon. So here's what Luke says about him. Now we're picking up in verse 25. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly awaiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Now here is a man who had hope. You could almost literally say he'd been kept alive by hope. He is waiting for Christ to come, as we are now in the early days of December. Now, he, we've got to assume he was an old man since we know he was close to his time of death. So maybe since the time that he was a child and began to understand the idea of a Messiah from uh, the, the Jewish writings, maybe all that time he'd been waiting. How long? 50 years, maybe even longer. And what's he been thinking about all those 50 years? Well, the Old Testament is shot through with promises of the Messiah, the God's anointed one, it means. It's, it's the same word as Christ. So Messiah and Christ, same word in two different languages. They both mean God's anointed one. So there are all these promises all through the Old Testament that the Messiah will come to Israel. But I wonder how much Simeon understood of who the Messiah would be. Well, let's see what happens next. So now we're reading on. That day, the Spirit led Simeon to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. Now you can really feel the weight of this, can't you? It's, it's literally the event that Simeon's whole life has been leading up to. And he's seen, he says, I've seen your salvation. Who's it for? Who's the good news for? Well, it's really interesting if you contrast what it says about Simeon before and after seeing Jesus. Before it says he was waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. Now, he was thinking about, if you like, a little provincial national Messiah who was just for Israel. But when he sees Jesus, what does he say? He says, I've seen the salvation that you have prepared for all people. Now, did Simeon maybe just mean all Jewish people? No, he didn't, because the very next thing he says is this. He, Jesus, is a light to reveal God to the nations. Not just to a nation, the nations, the whole world, in other words. You remember the angels singing peace to men on earth, not just uh, obviously meaning people, humans, uh, women included. So peace to people on earth, not just peace to people in Israel, but on earth. The whole world is included here. Now, when Simeon saw the baby Jesus, his eyes were opened and he understood much more than he grasped until then. Now he understood how much greater God's plan was than perhaps he'd been thinking about through those 50 years. Just thinking about someone who would come and lead Israel, maybe out from being uh, an invaded nation under the heel of the Romans. No, so, so much more. And of course, this promise for the Old Testament had always been in, uh, sorry, the promise for every nation had always been in the Old Testament. Let me give you just one example from the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 1, verse 11. My name will be great among the nations, from where the sun rises to where it sets. In other words, the whole span from east to west across the whole earth. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. So here we are now in Advent. It's the time when we're waiting to see Jesus. Now, we're not just waiting 24 days for Santa to turn up with reindeer and presents and to drink all our port and eat our mince pies. 
It's a longer wait than that, isn't it? It's longer even than the 40 days of waiting that we had earlier this year. It's not just the 50 years of Simeon's life from when he began to understand the Messiah to when he saw Jesus. It's not just the 400 years since the last of the Old Testament prophets, Malachi, wrote those words that we've just read. You know, Malachi, if he'd stayed alive, would have been waiting 400 years for Jesus. But it goes back so much further than that. You know, Simeon's words, when he speaks after seeing Jesus, they're full of Old Testament references. Lots of them to Isaiah, who lived 300 years before Malachi. So, for example, when um, Simeon says, my eyes have seen your salvation, that refers back to Isaiah 62 and verse 11, when he says, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your salvation is coming. And elsewhere in Isaiah, we read about this great broadening of God's purposes from just one little nation in the Middle East to the whole world. So here's what Isaiah again says. This is in uh, chapter 49, verses 5 and 6. Now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. The Lord says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and to bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So right back there, 700 years before Simeon said, he is a light to reveal God to the nations, Isaiah saw that. And there's so much more in Isaiah. He, maybe of all the Old Testament prophets, most clearly saw who and what the Messiah would be. Now here he is describing the Messiah in chapter 61 now of Isaiah. Familiar words for some of us. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favour has come. Now this is Isaiah seeing clearly, anointed by the Holy Spirit, understanding what the Messiah is going to be. Not just a powerful person, but a compassionate person. Not just ruling, but liberating. And it's a great description of Jesus, isn't it? And that's why 700 years after Isaiah, Jesus stands up in Luke chapter 4, verse 20. You might remember the story. He reads those words from the scroll of Isaiah in the synagogue. And he says to them, Today these words are fulfilled in your hearing. He's talking about himself. The one who comes to bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. So this premise goes back 700 years before the time of Christ. But wait, it goes back further. It goes back a thousand years. Because think about David, King David, who also saw something. Do you know, God spoke to him. And he saw things that he could not have understood naturally. David wrote these words, for example. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Now you see, David again here, he understands that God the Father, speaking to Jesus the Son, promises him not just Israel, but the nations, the ends of the earth. So it goes back a thousand years before Jesus, this understanding that the great promise of salvation is for the whole world. But wait, it doesn't go back 1,000 years, it goes back 2,000 years. Uh, think about Abraham. God said this to him. Right back in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. I will cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars of the sky, and I will give them all these lands. Listen. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years before Christ, Abraham saw it. So Simeon's 50 years of waiting might seem long to us when, we're used to, when we did 40 days of waiting earlier in the year. He waited 50 years. That was just the last leg of a relay, if you like, running thousands of years. And I kind of imagine Abraham and David and all the, the prophets and Isaiah and Malachi and, and coming through to Simeon, like a, a great relay race, all carrying this baton down through the ages of having seen 
what God is going to do. And having seen beyond the idea that God is the God of Israel, to recognising that his love and his compassion and his power extend to all of us in every nation all around the world. So there's this heritage behind us of Abraham, David, Isaiah, Malachi, Simeon. And now here we are, 2,000 years later, we're still waiting. Waiting to see Jesus. Waiting for Christmas. Waiting for the birth of the Messiah that Simeon saw as a light to reveal God to the nations. And this is why I think Advent, this time of waiting, is almost as important as Christmas itself. Because it's a reminder of what we need in these dark times. It isn't just uh, turkeys and crackers and presents. Now, I've got, again, understand me, I've got nothing against those things. I'm a big fan of turkey in particular, especially if you roast it with bacon wrapped over the... But anyway, let's not get too distracted. Those things are a celebration. But what we can remember is what they're a celebration of. They're not the thing. They're not what we're celebrating. They're what we're celebrating with. What we celebrate is that a Messiah has come to us, God's anointed one, who is not just for Israel, but for every person in every nation. And who is not just a mighty king who reigns, but also a gentle, loving friend who binds up the brokenhearted, who brings good news to the poor, who proclaims that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. And that's why that little passage in Isaiah that Jesus quotes later ends by saying, Tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favour has come. And that is a Christmas worth waiting for.